Hello, everybody. Welcome to another exciting installment of the 2014 Food for Thought series at the Whaling Museum. If you haven't already, please take the time now to silence your cell phones as to not disrupt our presentation today. We thank you, as always, for supporting this free community program, which is made possible in part by the MS Worthington Foundation. Today's guest, independent filmmaker Jay Craven, has written, produced, and directed six feature films, including Where the Rivers Flow North, A Stranger in the Kingdom, The Year That Trembled, Disappearances, Northern Borders, and many, many, many other projects. Uh, his films have been played in numerous U.S. venues and 52 countries. His work has been seen on channels such as Showtime, Stars, Encore, the Sundance Channel, the Disney Channel, and PBS affiliates in 14 states. Special screenings and festivals include Sundance, South by Southwest, the AFI Fest, the Nantucket Film Festival, Lincoln Center, the Smithsonian, Harvard Film Archives, and La Cinemateca Nacional de Venezuela. Craven's first feature, Where Rivers Flow North, was a finalist for the Critics Week at the Cannes International Film Festival. He has been a professor of film studies at Marlborough College since 1998, and his latest film, Peter and John, will begin filming on Nantucket in April 2014. So we're very excited. Um, so if everybody could join me in welcoming our guest today, Jay Craven. Landed, right? Yes, Mike. Oh, I could, I could do something else. Um, did I turn it on? There we go. Okay. Yes. Hello. There we go. All right. Um, anyway, so I hope we can have some dialogue back and forth. I think that um, every day I learn new things about Nantucket. I went to see John Stanton's movie last night about wooden boats, and halfway through I sort of said to myself, wow, these people are really into boats, aren't they? Because <laughs> I live in Vermont, although I, I told a story to a couple of people I was hanging out with about the one and only time I ever bought a boat. Um, although my grandfather, who raised me, was actually the director of the Port of Philadelphia, so he was into boats, and, and he would take us on boats. I've always loved boats, but I don't feel very confident about actually making them stop when I want to, or, you know what I'm saying? Uh, that was another revelation I had, actually, on Nantucket when I rented a boat one day and took my family out and started drifting towards other boats, and they're like, stop! <laughs> um, but anyway, I, my sort of... Um, mission has been focused on place-based cinema, the idea that Hollywood should not have a monopoly on the stories that get told, uh, partly because I think when, um, when big commercial productions come into a rural place in particular, but, you know, that there's a tendency to stereotype characters for one thing, uh, and I think we've seen it over many years, and of course there have always been, uh, there have also been concerns about stereotyping of gender and stereotyping about race and, and, and these various questions. And if we don't generate a, an indigenous cinema, a cinema that is rooted in place, trying to work towards an inside perspective of place, then we are left only with the stereotypes that are created through media, and th after time we begin to accept those. And so my goal has partly been to try to render more complex interpretations of place through character uh, and through natural setting. Um, in the films that I've made in Vermont, um, Where the Rivers Flow North, the first, I mean, it was about this old logger who really couldn't um, let go of this spectacular natural world that he inhabited, but neither could he tame it. And so the natural world played a very powerful role uh, in that film. In uh, a picture I made in 2007 called Disappearances, which is a whiskey smuggling adventure, sort of a magical realist whiskey smuggling adventure set during Prohibition, uh, again, the natural world was powerful. And 
uh, untamable, but it was also a source of sort of magic and mystery and things that had gone before which continued to be present. Uh, this notion that the past, I mean, Faulkner said it, the past is never dead. It's not even past. This notion that the past is present is an idea that I worked with a lot in the last two films I made, and it's, it's something that really interests me um, in terms of how history plays in any film, because I think that historical um, themes and even characters cont continue to resonate contemporaneously. And if you're going to make a movie that starts to explore the historical moment, I think it's crucial to prioritize those themes and ideas that do remain relevant contemporaneously. And there's plenty of those, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and so history has always interested me, um, but I don't claim to be an expert. And in making a film for Nantucket, uh, on Nantucket, uh, I have had to be immensely aware of the limitations that I bring to it in terms of um, situating the, the narrative in this place. Um, nonetheless, it interests me a lot, and I've worked hard to try to advance that idea. Um, and I've always seen my work as something particular to New England. Uh, even though I've made films in Vermont, my overall mission has always been that the cinema that I sought to develop was a New England cinema. I never really saw it simply as a Vermont cinema, simply because Vermont's not big enough. Um, and because uh, it interests me how northern New England and southern New England either connect or don't connect. And I think that in the modern world, they connect less, probably, than uh, even you know, 50 or 100 years ago. Now, maybe I'm wrong about that. I mean, certainly there's, more, there's easier fluidity between northern and southern New England in terms of travel. But I also think that that cultural awareness, partly because of the, just the onslaught of contemporary images that we experience through media and through internet, uh, have tended to homogenize the American experience in some ways away from a sense of place. So that, you know, um, I mean, I, but I take great <clears throat> pleasure when, for example, our technical director here uh, this afternoon comes to me and says, oh, by the way, I grew up in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont. Literally two miles away from the writer, Howard Frank Mosher, who I've been working with for 25 years. And he went, I said, well, did, did Garrett Kaiser teach you in high school, who's another writer from the Northeast Kingdom? He said, oh, yes, he taught me two classes. And did you know Dennis Mienka, uh, who was this house painter that I cast in my first three films. And he said, oh, yeah, I went to school with, her with his uh, daughter. And you know, so I'm, what I'm saying is that there are, there are many connections between northern and southern New England. And it's not that big. I mean, well, it actually is pretty big. But I mean, if you were to think, uh, on, we live in such a big country that sometimes we don't even know how to think about region or place. Because we tend to think of ourselves as Americans, certainly first. Uh, and New Englanders second, probably if we think of ourselves as New Englanders at all. Who here has, has, a sense, uh, has a consciousness that they think where they identify themselves as New Englanders, meaning in some way connected to Maine, Vermont, or Connecticut? Does anybody think of themselves that way? Yeah, you do, yes. Sometimes I say it's the people that are in the less uh, important places like Vermont that probably think about it more. I don't know. We're, in Vermont, everybody thinks about Burlington, but nobody thinks about the Northeast Kingdom, right? Because we're just these little puny, you know, poor rural people. And Burlington is like, wow. Um, but anyway, um, the fact is New England has mountains. New England has uh, a coast, for starters. 
And if you're a person living in Vermont, you're always aware of those rare opportunities that you get to go to the coast. And you value that and you think about it. And in fact, in my life, the place that I've spent the second longest uh, period of time, the largest number of days in my life besides Vermont, it is Nantucket. I started coming here when I was 17 years old and have come pretty much every year since then, but I've never been a homeowner, but, I, but, but Nantucket has this fabulous infrastructure of guest houses, you know, more really so, and, and in a configuration that's quite unique, uh, where you just, you know, take a bike and get on a ferry and come here and, you know, for a reasonable amount of money, you can stay for a week or three days or four days, and, you know, my sons have brought their girlfriends here and we've been at the, you know, the Fourth of July parades and done the fireworks and been here at Christmas Stroll, and in fact, I've also taught kids in the Nantucket High School for the last uh, four years um, through the Teen View filmmaking program that the Nantucket Film Festival and the Athenaeum uh, co-sponsored. So I also have come increasingly to be connected to families. Uh, the kids from my Teen View program have come to Marlboro College to be in involved with summer programs there, and we're, we're now making this new movie through a configuration of 20 professionals and 30 students from 10 different colleges. And, you know, two of the students, uh, one of the students in the program is Grace Deneen, who's actually a second semester high school student at Nantucket High School. She is fully enrolled in our program. She's been with us from j since January. She also was part of the Teen View program that I ran. Sean Allen, who was another teen, uh, teenager that I worked with, uh, through the Teen View program, is now a freshman at Antioch, and he's about to join us for the second half of the semester making the film. So anyway, I don't feel like a complete outsider to Nantucket, but that does not diminish the fact that in approaching a Nantucket subject uh, and place, there aren't many challenges, and I don't pretend to be the master of any of them. However, uh, I've worked at it, and I see Francis here, and I see Betsy here today, and th those are two of the people that have helped to inform my awareness and experience of Nantucket uh, through history. Uh, and there are others. I mean, Nat Philbrick has been helpful, and uh, there, of course, is, I mean, there's no place like Nantucket for the careful stewardship of its history. I mean, I sometimes remark that, you know, the Nantucket Historical Society has like 32 employees, and the Vermont Historical Society for the entire state has six. Uh, so there you go. Uh, you guys are taking care of business when it comes to knowing that history and what a fascinating and what a fabulous history it is uh, when you think about the start of abolition movements, uh, when you think of Frederick Douglass, when you think of the Quaker tradition, when you think of whaling. I mean, I just, when I start really taking a look de in any detail about this whole whaling thing, I'm just like, are you kidding me? People would go out for three or four years hunting, and, and then get in a small boat to take on, you know, for the final throes of the battle. I mean, there's nobody in Vermont who did stuff like that. <laughs> I mean, trees, okay, fine. But, and even moose, I mean, you know, a moose is nothing. <laughs> and of course, I was joking yesterday, because we were talking about hunting on Nantucket, and Charles Bartlett, and Russell Bartlett, who is our, one of our co-producers, also, of course, grew up on Nantucket and uh, is proving to be a valuable and fabulous uh, resource for us. But Charles has been cooking all of our meals all week, and we've been hanging out. And he's sort of a dead ringer for my brother in California, who I don't get to see very often, so it's sort of fun to... Um, but anyway, Charles was talking about deer hunting on Nantucket. And of course, you know, hunting's a big deal in Vermont. But uh, I said, well, in Vermont, of course, we have moose, and where I live, we also have bear, bears, and I've seen three bobcats where I live, and so that probably is not so common on Nantucket. Um, also, there are no um, cluster flies down here, which were a big item in my last movie, but uh, that's another question altogether. But there are green flies and deer flies, and anyway. Um, so I said Howard Dean was the governor of Vermont when Vermont started its moose hunting season. And uh, he, he said when it was being proposed, I refuse to, be, to, to support this idea. I refuse to be a party to people shooting at a parked car, which requires a specific knowledge of how the moose operate and how they move, which isn't much. Anyway, um, 
Let me just talk a little bit about this particular story we're getting to. I also have Abby Vollmer here as one of our students, uh, is actually a Northeast Kingdom, Vermont native, uh, went to Emerson College, is about to you know, continue her college experience next year elsewhere. Um, also, Hannah McCarthy is here, who uh, is a Massachusetts native and a Bennington College graduate, and she's handling public relations and some fundraising um, and press for us. And so these are two of the faces, at least, of the people we, we are having here. Uh, we will have a crew, as I say, of about 20, 22 professionals, 30 students uh, from really all over the country who, who are, half of them are here right now, and the other half will be coming late next week. Um, anyway, so let's think about this project for a second. It's based on a French novel, so so much for my, you know, tireless commitment to Nantucket, right? So we're going to start with a French novel. Uh, so this underscores the fact that ultimately what we are doing is, is articulating fiction. Uh, we are not making a film that, you know, for better or worse, can be true in every detailed sense to the history and to the culture of Nantucket. We are also setting in 1872, and so that automatically puts us in a very particular time period that we are trying to understand as well as we can. But, for example, as we start to present costumes to our lead actress, and Abby is going to talk more about that, who is going to be played by Jacqueline Bissett, who um, is a well-known Hollywood actress. She's actually British. We run into a couple of things, one of which is she suddenly wants a plunging neckline which was not common in 1872 on Nantucket. But, now it's interesting because, you know, it, a few years later it was, and in fact, 1872, this is a fashion statement, it was beginning to develop, and so if, if, if she in fact had, was wearing, wearing this kind of costume, it would mean that she was very fashion conscious. But her character actually has spent time in Boston and is a devotee of theater, and so, you know, we're working with it. And of course, we want our lead actress to be happy. Um, and so, this is something we deal with. Also, she has a British accent. Well, Nantucket has always been a place where people have come. Yes, am I right about that? Uh, and her husband will be played by Gordon Clapp, who is a native of New Hampshire. So, he is of New England. But will we be working tirelessly to, to render an authentic Nantucket accent for 1872? The answer is no. Because if we tried, it could be the worst thing you've ever heard in your life. Okay? Because each of the actors would bring to the project a different ability or lack of ability to work with accent, first of all and we could easily end up with a hodgepodge of six or eight different attempts to render a Nantucket accent. And so what we work with instead is language, and we try to have the language reflect the period more than the accent. And, and some colloquialism that we are aware of through our research, although we're not pushing it, but, you know, in, but if, if in passing, um, Charles Rowland, the, the father figure here, refers to his departed friend as the finest kind. We get it, okay, but we're not, we're not pushing it. Uh, you know, likewise, other elements that come into play. Um, Deborah Beale, who was one of the first people I talked to this project about, uh, when I said 1872. The novel is a French novel based on uh, work by Guy de Maupassant. It, it was considered a groundbreaking novel for its psychological characterization, which is to say that it was moving past sort of naturalistic and um, uh, realistic depictions of character simply doing what they do to starting to, to try to probe interior states of mind. Uh, and it was written, I think, 1880 or close to 1880. So it's also a novel that comes from an historical time that was considered a pioneering novel that, in fact, influenced uh, Tolstoy uh, and Nabokov and Henry James. These are all writers that pointed to this novel as influencing them, and it was actually one of Vincent van Gogh's 
favorite novels as well as I discovered last week in letters that he wrote to his brother. He was a big Maupassant fan and really loved this story. But so, so character, um, so, so it's rendering a, a psychological condition of character, which of course we, we see in films certainly contemporaneously, uh, especially European films, uh, more so I think than American films, but this film will be working to uh, develop that. Um, it, it, the story is about two brothers who live in a, it is very distinctly a seaside story and it draws on the idea of the beach and the ocean as uh, for metaphor and for theme uh, and for symbol in the story. Uh, but it's two brothers, one a young doctor, probably around 30, and the other in his early 20s who mostly wants to have fun, uh, is not very diligent and is frankly borrowing money and mooching money off of his brother and which forces his brother to, among other things, have to borrow money from his mother, which he doesn't like to do. Um, so two brothers that are, I mean, they're close to a point, but they're very different. Uh, and the older brother has a kind of sense of himself as a moral being. Um, 1872, as I'm sure everybody in the room knows, was what was called, and Deborah Beale pointed this out to me, first, for the first time, uh, Nantucket's ghost period, which is to say following the decline of whaling and prior to the rise of tourism. So that's an interesting time. It was actually pretty sparsely populated at that time. The population of Nantucket, and Frances and I have also talked about some, and she sent me the entire census. I know everybody's name who was living in Nantucket in 1872, uh, or close to it. But um, uh, the population was only about 3,500 people, whereas it had been up to, what, 10 or 12,000 probably 20 years earlier. So that's sort of interesting. The black population uh, had also declined significantly. Uh, um, partly because there were more opportunities for African Americans to go places after the close of the Civil War. Uh, we, I've looked into uh, some of the detail of Nantucket during the Civil War, and the number of men who went was, was it 400, 450? Something close to that who went to fight the Civil War, and 73 were killed while they were there. And in Bob Mooney's book, um, Nantucket in the Civil War, there is a story which, in fact, we do recount um, of the first steamer coming back to Ireland carrying soldiers from the war. The, the enlistments early in the war were only three, three months because everybody thought it was going to be over fast. Have you ever heard that before? Uh, and, of course, it wasn't over fast. And, uh, but the first ship was coming, the first steamship was coming carrying soldiers back from the battlefront, and it was a town celebration. Everybody was at the docks, and suddenly the, the boat comes into... Uh, view and the flag is at half mast and there are six Nantucket soldiers who have been killed who are on that boat. Now we work with that idea as the motivating factor for Peter the young doctor to enlist in the war. That he was moved by this moment of recognizing loss for the island in the war and he was a, he, his family background is Quaker he did not want to fight, but he, could, he felt he could serve the Union cause this way, and he did. And uh, he brings, and, and so he experienced Fredericksburg and Gettysburg and the most intense parts of the Civil War. Now, John was too young, did not participate, the younger brother. Anyway, one night, a courier comes to a family dinner and brings news of a large inheritance for John, the younger brother. And so this causes Peter to begin to question things, uh, ultimately, mostly himself. But he questions, he starts to question his family. He, he begins to darken a bit and to, um, to question whether his mother may have had an affair with the benefactor, uh, who was a family friend that, um, that he knew as a child with his brother, a guy who moved off island, and we are, we are positioning him partly at, with Betsy's encouragement early on, probably casual at best, but as, as a whale oil merchant. And we are positioning the father as a whaler who had done two or three expeditions and said, this is not for me. And Nat Philbrick talked to me some about that kind of Nantucketer who just said, this is too much, and but made some money and was able to retire sort of early, 
wishing he had more money than he does, but enough to sort of get by and, and live a life that is respectable, I guess, middle class is what you would consider it to be. Of course, we go back to this time, the average income of a person uh, in the United States, anybody know what it was in 1870 uh, or 1880? It was less than $200 a year. Um, in fact, it was a little bit lower in 1880 than it was in uh, 1870, strangely. But um, in any case, it wasn't a lot of money. Um, we don't dwell a lot on that, although, we're, and we're actually we have to do one more round of trying to think this through. A dollar was worth roughly about $23 today. Uh, and the inheritance that, that John receives is currently pegged at $17,000 a year. Huge amount of money. Um, Maybe it's too much. I don't know. We're going to, this weekend, talk a little bit more about it. But um, in any case, the, so the younger brother's inheritance causes the older brother to begin to suspect his mother. Then a younger woman arrives on the island, and both boys become interested in her. And so you can just see sort of a little bit of how the dynamics of character will play out dramatically in terms of conflict, tension, some competition, and um, there's plenty to work with from that point of view. But the goal for me was to continue to try to dig it deep into character and try to avoid sort of contrivances of plot. And so for Peter, the journey of the film really is a psychological journey in terms of how he now relates to his mother, to whom he was very close. I mean, Maupassant was clear about this. And, and Maup this notion of illegitimacy and paternity were themes that ran through a lot of Maupassant's work, partly because he felt that he was the illegitimate son of Flaubert. And so this is something that he questioned, because his father left his family very early, like when he was two years old. Flaubert became a mentor to him and, of course, was a great French writer. And it was something that he never really resolved in his life. And Maupassant died young. He was a little bit, you know, living outside the tracks and died, I think, at the age of 37. So um, in any case, these are true to Maupassant's characters and story that we develop uh, these ideas. And Peter, who who frankly, and another part of the research we've done, would not have been a licensed doctor on Nantucket. He, in fact, his experience as a medic is probably what we would consider to be his primary training for the work that he did uh, here. But there weren't really licensed doctors on Nantucket, as I understand, until the late 1880s, probably. Uh, but this was common practice in many places. Um, the Civil War also. Now, in a French novel that you get, that you're going to adapt to Nantucket in 1872, there's no mention, of course, of the Civil War, and not much mention even of military service, although there is a little bit in the novel. But here, seven years past the end of the Civil War, that legacy would continue to be felt, at least based on my reading of, among other things, The Inquirer and Mirror, where in December of 1872, uh, an, there is an, a front page article about revisiting the prisoner camp at Andersonville, for example. And this was a pretty, I mean, Andersonville, of course, just being a notorious for the suffering that uh, soldiers uh, experienced there. So this bubbles up into the story is Peter's experience uh, with having been in the Civil War. And the young woman who comes to the island comes to the island because she's looking for Peter, because she was married to a man who was killed at Gettysburg, who had an encounter with Peter during the war. That's what motivates her to come here. And she has secrets. And she, she comes knowing that Peter also has a secret. And that their common secrets grow out of the experience of the war, which was disruptive to both of them. And the, his, the, and the woman is Hispanic, well, I don't know if we have a whole lot of record of Hispanic women coming to Nantucket, you know, who had experience with the war. This is, again, where we move into fiction. But her story is based on an oral history of an Hispanic woman living in uh, northern Florida during the Civil War, whose family had fled Florida based on her father's opposition to slavery and Spanish colonialism and whose family farm was occupied by Union soldiers, which um, resulted in the sexual assault on her two sisters and her flight from the home on horseback where she became a Confederate spy. Um, and where she, you know, where the family was actually pro-Lincoln. But the experience of this incident 
caused her just for her own safety to flee. And she, what she would do is report troop movements um, in Florida. An interesting story that also for me introduced some ambiguity into the sort of the way we view Confederate and Union, strictly speaking, uh, in terms of the Civil War, which I actually also believe is largely unresolved and not sufficiently explored in our culture. And that some of the divides we continue to experience in America today are rooted in the terrible division of the Civil War. And of course, Nantucket as a leading force in abolition and also Quaker pacifist sentiment and um, as part of New England, of course, uh, was very much a part of it. Uh, Nantucket also was the, and I think Francis told me this, but was the only Massachusetts chapter of Civil War veterans that was racially integrated. Um, also interesting. And of course, Nantucket also had the neighborhood known as Guinea or New Guinea or Newtown out by the Five Corners. And um, something else that Betsy told me, which probably she'll live to regret, or I, I, we won't claim it, we won't pin it on her anymore. Uh, but when I talked about this young woman arriving on the island, Betsy said she would not have been welcomed. <laughs> she would not have been welcomed. <laughs> that, you know, Nantucket could take a dim view of strangers arriving. And then, in fact, at the Athenaeum, there were, you know, guest books to sign in, and there was one for strangers, right? Yeah. Uh, and that it was a proprietorship, and, you know, there was a fairly tight... People knew if you were new, if you were new to the island, you... I mean, I, it's probably true today. <laughs> not that the, we, strangers are not welcome. I mean, here I am, right? I, who should I... Who, who am I to talk? But anyway, this is just a sort of snapshot that I'm trying to provide in terms of how we are both trying to keep these fabulous, alive, sometimes volatile notions of history alive through characterization and weaving it into a French narrative. And the notion of psychological characterization, to me, actually matched very well with the idea of uh, post-war 19th century Nantucket and the, the, the originating story coming from France. Uh, however, there were probably, I mean, we know for sure that there were people will say on any number of occasions, oh, that's not the way it was, or you got this wrong. I mean, you know, I'm ready for, I mean, I get it in Vermont, so don't worry about that. Uh, and so, again, we are not making a film that is in, that is committed itself to the historical record. We are making a film that is set in period and place and are working to keep that fluid and expressive and hopefully uh, to stimulate consideration and conversation about all of that. Anyway, I want to bring Abby on because we don't have a whole lot of time and I also want some questions um, to show some of the costumes that we are working with uh, from the period. Yes? Thank you. I mean, I don't, maybe we're, I hope we're not out of time already, but. Testing, oh, there we go. Hi, I'm Abby Vollmer. Um, so I'm one of the students working on this film and I'm working in the costume department along with uh, two other students and a professional costume designer, Sarah Beers, who has been in the business a long time and has, work, has worked on many Oscar-nominated films. She's fantastic, uh, really knows what she's doing. Um, so I'm just going to walk you through what our process has been in terms of costuming this film because what costumes are what I consider to be the one of the most integral pieces of bringing, like Jay said, bringing the history alive and really bringing the audience into the time period. So what we began with was your basic period research of uh, the, like it says, 65, 66. High fashion would not have reached Nantucket yet. You wouldn't have seen people walking around in like the cover of Vogue type outfits. Um, so we took it back a little bit to make it more accurate. Um, so what we looked at first was the shape, and this is just an example of a woman's dress. The shape was this kind of sideways bow tie thing, um, and buttons, lace, trim, sloping neckline, emphasis on the width of the hips and the shoulders and the face, so that has to do with hairstyles as well. Um, and then for men, 
uh, kind of the opposite, very much tall, thin, uh, double-breasted jackets, think like Abraham Lincoln type stovepipe, top hats, um, lots of different kinds of facial hair. Uh, <laughs> And these are just more examples of generic period outfits. Um, however, again, going along with what Jay said, it would be cheap to take these examples and say, this is what everyone on Nantucket was wearing at the time. So our next step was to research through the Nantucket Historical Association uh, photographs of people during the time period and what they really were wearing, what the people were wearing, not what the magazines were telling them to wear. Um, so these are just some photographs that we looked at. These are just, you know, men on the beach doing their work. These are civilians. These are not models or actors. These are just people doing work. Uh, your regular townspeople, um, which are the type of people we're trying to portray. You can see the, your classic Civil War style hat on that postman, actually, which is interesting. Um, so yeah, these are, these are the photographs that we are working from, and obviously this is just the sampling because we have many, many, many of them. Um, <laughs> and right down to you know, the types of shoes people were wearing, the types of shoes men were wearing, the types of shoes women were wearing, which interestingly enough, the shoes are actually coming back into style, so there's lots of people who can bring their own, <laughs> bring their own shoes from modern times that completely work for the period. Um, and this actually, this was one of my favorite pictures. She, I forget her name, but she was one of the first, she was the first woman pastor, at least on the island, if not in New England. Um, so I thought she was a great character to work from, and, and her outfit is perfect in terms of the style of the time, and I think it's a fantastic photograph. Lots of different characters. Nantucket is not short in uh, great characters. So then our next step was designing these costumes for the specific characters. So these are some sketches that uh, the three of us, me and the two other students, went uh, and made for some of the main characters, um, which was great fun, <laughs> as I'm sure you can imagine. This is a sketch that I made of the younger brother, the more carefree uh, guy who doesn't necessarily iron his clothes or wear his hat straight, and uh, just inherited a ton of money. This is a lawyer character. This is the mother character. No plunging neckline in this drawing, but we'll see. Uh, the father character. And some other, that's actually the oldest brother there on the end. And some other characters. So that was our, that was a part where we really felt like we had some creative input in the project, uh, which is great. Our next step was to go to costume warehouses uh, throughout uh, Massachusetts, New York, and Connecticut. Uh, so these are studios, theaters, um, and just costume supply places <coughs> that rent out costumes um, for theater productions as well as film productions. and. Uh, they have costumes from all periods. So what we found were, and again, this is just the sampling. We have many more than these, but these are some of the highlights, I thought. Uh, female dress, uh, a lot of tops and skirts. I think this is a fantastic piece. This will be for the uh, young Hispanic gal who arrives on the island. This will be her costume. One of them, Costumes, by the way, cost $350 each to rent. Uh, and so we are needing you know, probably, what, close to 80 costumes. So the budget on my last film was $2,000 for costumes. It's like $30,000 this time. And I felt that, co that given that we cannot create the world, this is a very low-budget film. We can talk about that separately. And we're still raising money, by the way, if anybody would like to know more about that. Um, but the, in a way that we, there are great locations, and we can get a lot of history expressed through the locations. But I felt that costumes were the additional sort of icing on the cake to give particularity to the period. Absolutely. Um, things you wouldn't think about, like neckties and, and additional collars, are, are bits and pieces that we've managed to um, get from all these different costume 
resources as well as aprons and the pinafore for a small girl. Uh, bonnets are lots of fun, I think, and uh, come in lots of different shapes and sizes. Men would have worn vests almost all the time underneath, over their shirts and under their jackets. Um, these pictures are a little uh, oversaturated. They wouldn't have been such bright colors, but <laughs> um, again, jackets, the left two being for sailors or boaters. Um, yeah, the color renditions here are actually off, but um, <laughs> True. that's this, actually black. Yeah, for example, this top hat is black, not bright blue. We wouldn't have seen many bright blue top hats at the time. Um, but again, these are things that take us, really take us into the time period. This is myself actually in, <laughs> in one of the costumes. I think it's much nicer to see them on people rather than hanging on a hanger. It gives you more of an idea of the shape of things. Um, there would have been, for women especially, layers upon layers of petticoats, hoop skirts, um, bustles. Uh, it's amazing how much this weighs. Tons. And it, it, for the actors especially, and here's a picture of Jacqueline Bissett, Bissett. For the actors especially, putting them in a costume uh, is, is like giving them a second skin. Here is a part of your character that you need to take and embrace and and become. If you think it's that easy <laughs> as giving them a costume and saying them and having them say, oh, thank you, yes, I will do this. As my uncle used to say, you have another think coming. Um, actors are bringing their own ideas of the characters, their own ideas of the time period, their own research, their own thoughts, their own feelings. Um, so it becomes, especially with people like Jacqueline, who are more professional, who have been in the business a very long time, it becomes a dialogue, it becomes a conversation, it becomes a work in progress, which Jay has explained and um, has been very interesting and enlightening working in the costume department with the people within the department, with the people on the film and with the actors who we're bringing in. So Great. that's yeah, Terrific. an overview of what I had to Let's say. If, uh, <laughs> if people have questions, I'm happy to take them. I will, while, while we're doing that, um, I also have a couple of the specific uh, costumes that we've been proposing to Jacqueline that have either passed muster or more often not. Um, but anyway, I'll try to find it. But anyway, any questions, comments? Does anyone yeah. have any questions? Uh, I'm just fascinated with this idea of, of somehow bringing together this French piece of fiction and the Nantucket setting. And I'm just wondering how that came to your mind, did, it, did, did the reading of Maupassant uh, suddenly say to you, oh yeah, hey, connection to Nantucket, or did the Nantuc your personal Nantucket experience somehow remind you of the Maupassant? What, what, what was going on there in your mind? Well, it was sort of both. Uh, I've always been interested, I've always wanted to make a seaside film. In fact, I might, if it works, I might make a second one, who knows, but we're not <laughs> thinking that far ahead. Um, I was asked to, de to work on this project, to, to help to develop a, the Maupassant story 10 years ago on a project that fell apart very close to the time that it was actually supposed to get shot. And so it has lingered in my mind because when you work in, on any screenplay uh, and spend a year or even two years, these characters start to inhabit your imagination. They become very real and you start to think about what they would do in any given situation. They actually do speak to you in strange ways and you dream about them and it's really sort of bizarre, but it's also one of the great satisfactions of having this fictional world that is part of your active uh, imaginary world. And so the, the project stayed with me, uh, and I always wanted to bring it back into play. Now, I made, I've made six feature films, and, and five of them were made on budgets of $2 million, where I raised you know, money in Vermont for the most part, and also got some foreign sales advances and blah, blah, blah. But for an independent filmmaker, it's not possible to sustain a career that way. And just to make a long story short, the industry does not pay well, fairly, you know, on time, whatever you want to say, when it comes to this kind of work. And so I set out, and I'd also worked over the years as a teacher in sort of what I consider to be progressive, unusual, innovative education projects. I started a circus for kids aged 10 to 17 called Circus Smirkus, you know. Uh, 27 years ago, and it's still going, and they travel even, and they in fact, in fact performed on Nantucket a few times. Um, 
But anyway, so faced with the challenges of how do you sustain a New England-based regional cinema, I came up with the idea of combining it with an innovative education program and reducing budgets from $2 million to $600,000. So this is a, a very small budget. The average Hollywood movie is $60 million budget, very small budget. And in doing so, uh, also to think about expanding outside of Vermont and try to really engage New England in this idea of how do we sustain a regional cinema. And I, and I came to Nantucket during the summer of 2011 or 12, 12 I guess, um, and somebody else put in motion a benefit event for the last film we did called Northern Borders, which is played here on Nantucket. And uh, I actually have some DVDs if anybody is looking for one. But uh, and we may play it again in the next couple uh, months. But um, And we did a benefit where an actor, Chris Noth, came to Nantucket for us. And while I was here organizing that benefit event, a half a dozen people said to me, why don't you make a movie on Nantucket? Or what do you, when are you going to make a movie on Nantucket? Or if you're here now uh, raising money, shouldn't that money go towards a movie on Nantucket? Or, you know, there are any, any number of configurations. And in fact, the newspaper questioned me about it, and I said, in fact, I had been thinking about a seaside story, and this it's, suddenly it seemed like the right time to do it. And I said, how about Peter and John? I mean, that's sort of how it happened. It was in August of 2012, and I was being interviewed by Lindsay for the INM. And I said, yeah, this is, you know, so it was one of two or three projects that I had that could be the next project after Northern Borders. It, it you know, is challenging. You know, this is hugely more challenging than the last picture we made, which basically has three characters in mostly one location, a mile from Marlboro College's campus. Uh, and it's actually more expensive also. I mean, the budget on that was 480,000. The budget on this is gonna be closer to 650. But on the other hand, we've also gotten fabulous cooperation, the Historical Association making available access to props, uh, the uh, Mariah Mitchell putting up our crew for very low uh, cost, uh, the youth hostel. I mean, there, there are just many well, fabulous. I mean, I, part of what I like so much about Nantucket, frankly, is the sense of community. It is one community. And where I live, you know, in rural northern Vermont, that same sense of connectedness and community is really the dominant factor. And so that's a, the long answer to your question. Um, I, I liked the story. Every story you do becomes personal. And if I were to be candid and off the record, I would say that, you know, this story is about two brothers who are close but find difference between them that strains them. I have that relationship with my younger brother who actually also, there is, I'll be very honest, has, there are questions about his paternity with it when my mother gets, you know, drinking too much, which is too often, you know, come up to play. But, you know, we're not going to go into a lot of detail. But, you know, my mother was also too close to me and to my brother. And so this is part of it. We're not going to, you know, but it gives me something to work with, okay? Every movie, you try to find personal connection, and you start to explore that. And so the film, all, the story also has personal connections uh, to me. I read it 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, and so it's, it's really been in my imagination. Although we had to rebuild the script completely, and the students have been majorly involved with that because there became a rights issue uh, that, that surfaced only in December. And so we have had to work dramatically, quickly, intensively with four hours of script discussions every week with students and everything else to rebuild the script. I believe it's a stronger script. People who've read both scripts believe it's a much stronger script in terms of character because it doesn't play in terms of the two brothers competing for the girl, for example. It's just a question of the girl is there. She's you know, quite compelling. Uh, and if she gets a visa, she'll actually be in the film. That's a whole other issue. She's, she's, co she's coming from Madrid. <laughs> we, are, we have mobilized the office of Senator Patrick Leahy and every possible, you know, she's fabulous. But anyway, um, instead it really, again, is, is rooted in the psychology of Peter. This shared history with Lucia, the young woman, and the fact that where it seems like there's a compatibility ultimately Peter's not able to, you know, do this. And then also questions of late 1870s uh, or mid, you know, early 1870s, a young woman comes here, this, this propensity to marry, this motivation to marry as part of what you do and how that plays and the attitude towards that. And frankly, the mother's attitude towards the younger woman, given the fact that she entered a marriage which was compromised, blah, blah, blah. There we go. Anybody else? Anybody else have a question? Yes. 
Uh, I am the writer of the script. I am the writer of the script, but the students are solicited on a regular basis to take their hardest critique against the script, to, write, to rewrite scenes, to propose dialogue, to discuss character, and they do. And no fewer than seven students have material in the script right now. And by the time we shoot it, the probably the number will be 10 or 11. Now, it's all the material that I approve. And so I get into dialogue with them, and they argue strongly. We could not find an Hispanic actress that we thought was right, for example, to play this part three weeks ago after having looked at 50. And I, I started talking about making the character a white Southern woman. And there was a firestorm immediately. <laughs> and, and an interview with our behind the scenes documentary crew about how could he sell us out in this way. The character will be Hispanic. Um, you know, there's a question, in the Maupassant novel, there's a barmaid, so-called. Well, this is another one of the realizations, which I haven't even totally figured out yet, but there were not so much taverns in New England, in, uh, I mean, in Nantucket in 1872. There was what was called, and Betsy explained to me, the grok shop. You could buy b a bottle of rum or whatever, but it was sort of the front parlor of a house more than it was a tavern, and it was not a big social situation. There was more of a bar scene sort of on the har on the, on the, uh, down by the harbor, sort of lingering maybe from the days of whaling, when in fact there probably was a big tavern scene, more so down there. But um, in any case, there's a barmaid in the Maupassant novel, and her name is Judy, and um, she there's suggested a past with Peter. And because this young woman is actually going to end up in a boarding house in what would have been New Guinea, or the Guinea part of town, uh, we've kept that character uh, who will be African American. Uh, but the students went back and forth and had a lot of deliberation about whether a romantic past with Peter should be suggested or not. And uh, including two African American students that are part of the project, and so that was a big dialogue as well. And so right now there is the hint of uh, a comradeship more than a romance between them. And um, anyway, so that's just an example. Uh, there was something else that came up a couple weeks ago, but the students have been substantially involved. I want, I mean, the Japanese, are we running out of batteries or am I just becoming electrified? Um, anyway, okay. Anyway, um, the, 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 the Japanese director, Kurosawa, Akira Kurosawa, always said, I never want to be the only person in conversation with my character. I want at least three other people always involved in the conversation with and about my characters. And I feel the same way. In this case, I've got 27 people, but you know, it could be. Uh, but I also do have experience with working with young people collaboratively in writing. And so I find it interesting. When I, 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 after a while, you try to develop instincts. That, that's how you make movies, you hope, is by drawing on the instincts that you develop over years. My instincts to know when a good suggestion is made, I think, are pretty good. And so when a student makes a suggestion that really has strength, value, originality, and can work, I'm totally open to it. I think it's great. Uh, and sometimes I'll even, I mean, some, and I will even sometimes give them the benefit of the doubt if I think that it's actually not really any better than what I've already got there. I will sometimes go with it anyway, just in the spirit of the collaboration. So that's sort of the honest uh, sort of perception on that. Here's a, here's a costume that we're still lobbying with Jacqueline to, to consider, which I think is fabulous. Um, here's another one that I think probably won't make it. Here's another one which I think is also terrific. Now, it would have a bustle, which it doesn't have here, right? Right, we have bustles, but this, 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 ma this, this mannequin does not have it. Here's another one which I'm sure will not pass muster. Then there are a couple of others. Um, these costumes are nice, don't you think? Um, we're now having to go to Los Angeles and possibly to London for the last few costumes on this. And costumes being brought in from London are a big deal for shipping. Um, also, the insurance on these and the cleaning costs, and if anything goes wrong, this is, this is a beach dress that we are proposing to Jacqueline right now for a beach scene. This is some more detail on it. 
This has not yet been approved. Um, let's see. Here's some nice, nice costumes. Look at this fabulous. She does like that one because the neckline is, um, and it's not like it's salacious, you know. Uh, very nice dress. This is, we just saw this one. So we're recycling a couple of them because we've basically exhausted the inventory of what's available on the East Coast and, we, and some of the West Coast. And we now, the idea that we have to go to London is going to be, there are many more period costumes from this time in London than there are in the United States. The guy that's going to play Peter, actually, is also a British actor, although he has uh, not a British accent. He plays American fine. He is named Christian Coulson. He was one of the uh, actors in Harry Potter. Uh, also, The Hours, he was in Harry Potter, uh, Chamber of Secrets, played the young Voldemort, a uh, character named Tom Riddle. This is nice, casual. That was not accepted. We've seen this one before. Look at this. Wow. I mean, it, it appears that people were very fashion conscious. We can say they weren't fashion conscious. Look at those. I mean, they're a lot more fashion conscious than people today. <laughs> anyway, any more questions? Yes. Do you consider having costumes made, or is that prohibitively expensive? Having bustles made or costumes made? Costumes. Costumes made would be, it would probably cost $2,000 a costume. Size has become another issue as well, and it, it's taken us time to get everybody cast, and the poor co co costume department is left sort of having to improvise. Um, and Hannah will have some information about the film available for people that are leaving. Um, we're also doing a Kickstarter campaign right now, which, which seeks to involve a, a whole lot of people in making donations to support it at levels of $5 that start at $5 and get perks and up to $10,000, blah, blah, blah. We're trying to raise $55,000 that way. Believe it or not, we're still raising money, but um, we're down to about needing to raise about $80,000 on the budget of 650000 which isn't too bad, but we still do need money, yeah. Sure. Read the, read the novel before you see the movie. I think it's fine. It's interesting. The movie I made last, Northern Borders, I would actually suggest seeing the movie before you read the novel. But with, with uh, Peter and John, I think reading the novel first is fine. Yes? It's a major negotiation. And actors, I mean, as Abby said, this becomes their second skin. Many actors find very specific and unexpected detail of character through what they wear through the way they are dressed, through the way their hair is dressed. A friend of mine who will be on this film, Bill Raymond, who played the Speaker of the House in Lincoln, Steven Spielberg's Lincoln, says that through the entire time that he was on set, Daniel Day-Lewis never appeared out of character. And that when he walked by, and you would, you would not say, Daniel, how are you? You would say, good morning, Mr. President. Now that's a little bit extreme, but this is the truth, the total truth. And so um, it, it would be hard for a director to impose a, a costume on an actor that did not want to wear that costume. It would not be smart. And as I say, these, these costumes, I mean, these are somewhat subtle differences, but our costume designer who just won an Emmy in the year 2014 is very particular about the work that she's doing. I mean, of the, of the people we have on set, my guess was, because a lot of my crew, very honestly, are nobody's older than 30 except for Sarah, the costume designer, and me. Basically, I think I'm right about that. Well, he's not, but he's a student. Uh, but I said we want Sarah to be the costume designer because costumes are where this is, are just going to be crucially important. And we didn't know that Jacqueline Bissett was going to be the actor even two weeks ago. But when it became clear that she was, you could bet this was going to be a huge negotiation. And it's not a negative thing. Um, and it, frankly, the, the, the process is informing more, me more about her character. And it will be something to work with. So it's very fertile, but it, it can be time consuming. And you can reach a point where we are right now a little bit 
the supply of authentic 1872 New England costuming is very scarce in the United States. Um, you know, and so the expense of it, this, this, the costuming is already $10,000 over budget. And it'll probably go another 5000 because it also costs $50 an hour to get people in the warehouses to pull costumes in Los Angeles. And, and then it has to all be FedExed across the country, hundreds of pounds of costumes. So it's just what you do. As I say, the last picture was set in 1956. You can go to thrift stores and people can wear t-shirts and jeans and you know it's not a big deal. But this is very particular and we want to do it right. As I say, this will not be a 100% accurate rec you know, reflection of Nantucket in 1872. Now we're calling it Nantucket, should we not? I mean, we can have that discussion too. Should it just be called, I don't know, the island? Uh, you know, I think that to call it Nantucket is okay. What do you think? Betsy, what do you think? Yeah? I mean, you know, as I say, but the, the story is primary. And when I saw the Civil War stuff starting to swamp the narrative, I had to push it back. And it's also true that you could, you know, that Nantucket detail could begin to become, it becomes more about that and it becomes a, a, a museum piece. It has to, the, the narrative is primary. And so that's Maupassant's story. And so that we are, you know, but then allowing it to filter through and breathe. And you want all these elements to breathe together. And the costumes are definitely part of that. Uh, I think that this woman, Louise Rowland, is going to be seen as a fashion forward character. Was there a fashion forward woman on Nantucket in 1872? Do we know her name? I don't think we do know her name, do we? Maybe we do. Um, anyway, but so a movie is ultimately an act of imagination. And I've always talked about Howard Mosher, my collaborator on a number of my Vermont movies, as somebody who writes from the perspective not of the historical record, but of the historical imagination. And they're all period stories, and they're all fabulous. And as I get into doing the detail on making them into movies, I find out that Howard, frankly, hasn't done great research in a few areas. Uh, but it's okay. And sometimes my stories are actually a little bit more historically researched than his novels, and vice versa. And he's given me loads of wonderful history and loads of wonderful characters, and that's ultimately what we make a movie. So thanks a lot for coming. Yeah, one more. Well, we will certainly be everywhere. We will play every town and village and neighborhood on the Cape and Islands during the summer of 2015. Uh, and who knows? I mean, we, uh, I think we will probably have something pretty close to being done by September, October, but I'm just, I can't be sure of exactly how it's going to go, but I hope so. We have an editing team this time, which we did not have last time, so that'll be good. All right, thank you to the Historical Association.